This is the Agentic Schools Podcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. I'm your host, Don Berg. Hello and welcome to the Agentic Schools podcast. I am here with Sivan Zafir. I said that wrong. <laughs> Zavahir. Zavahir. Uh, of Kinder Republic uh, in Sri Lanka. Um, Sivan, what we'd like to do with this is start with uh, a story. So tell me a story about a child or a family that really uh, maximized the opportunity that you gave them through your school. Um, okay, I'm done. If I may just sure. answer a bit more on not on a particular child, but about how the collective community has maybe made use sure. of this. So um, we had planned an excursion to the zoo in the sense that the children had figured out how much does it cost and how long and when to go and things like that. And we had um, at the time we planned it, it was raining, so we thought let's wait till the rain finishes. Then we thought the rains had finished, we scheduled it for a date, and then it started raining again, and then there was this concern about should we go or not, and then um, all the children were actually happy to go even in the rain, but two children did not have permission to go. So mm -hmm. majority still could go, but they felt that it was not fair to um, leave the other two behind, so they decided, agreed to postpone it till the weather improves. Then... Um, on the 12th of October, I left to, uh, on, to come to IDEC. And on the 13th, they had been in the school meeting to plan the excursion. They had uh, agreed to go to the zoo on the 20th, the following Friday. Um, my wife had mentioned that I would not be in the country at that time, but you know that had not been an issue somehow then. But over the weekend, my son suddenly realizes that I will not be there for the zoo excursion and he would like me to be there. So he sends a message on the Discord that uh, I wish uh, Sifan could be with us. And then another child who hadn't been present that day also said, me too. Um, now, in the meantime, this process of voting for things to be put on the schedule and things like that was also taking place and um, on the weekend. So I'm the one who goes through the votes and maps things out. So I made the schedule and I said, as per your last decision, mm -hmm. y'all are going to the zoo on Friday. So I've marked Friday as the zoo. Uh, but since this concern was raised, y'all can have a discussion and decide if you want to change it or not. And um, so the conversation had been taken up and five children had been in favor of postponing it for were in favor of going ahead as planned. Mm -hmm. Um, now, the way things happen is though that we don't, um, unless there's some very big time constraint, just go for a vote and make a decision. Mm -hmm. But it's just to see where, where, where do the thoughts lie, what does the opinion look like. And then we give opportunities for each side to make their case and try to convince the other party to change their mind. So mm -hmm. like a caucus system as I understand it. Um, so the reason for not postponing it was that we have been waiting for this for so long, it's already got postponed already and we don't want to postpone it anymore. And the reasons for postponing was that I had been involved in planning it, so it would be good to have me and then uh, there would then be one other adult who is available in case the children need help. Um, at which point my wife had observed that there would be at least one and maybe two other parents who would be with us, so that was not an issue. Um, and uh, interesting thing was one child raised the concern on do I want to come? So mm. yes, the children would like me to come, but if I don't want to come, then, then we should check with what my thoughts are. <laughs> and so I um, was able to respond to that on WhatsApp. And I had also told my son, because he was the one who messaged about this, that okay, you can bring this up and the children can decide and I am okay with whichever way they decide if they want to go ahead without me, if they want to post one, both are fine by me. And he was one of the people voting to postpone things mm -hmm. and it was not in a way in his favor to say that I didn't mind either way, <laughs> uh, but he did say it. Mm -hmm. He did say that, 
you know, this is what Sifan said about this. Um, so at the end of that first round, let's have discussion, the voting pattern hadn't changed. But then um, another argument came up, and this was, I think, led by the child who happens to be the youngest, mm -hmm. but also seems to have a very strong sense of fairness and social justice and things and had raised this question about, well, look, how would you feel if the date had been decided when you were not there and the date decided was a date you couldn't come, how would you feel about it? Mm -hmm. And that had then prompted the others to change their mind and eventually they had agreed to postpone it for one week. And um, I think in one way there's a little bit of happiness that they valued my company enough to want to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think I would be um, not unhappy if they had chosen also to go ahead because if at all what, um, what I would take pride in is the process they went through of hearing each other, mm -hmm. um, empathizing with that need, trying to talk through that thing and coming up with an answer that everybody seems to be happy with um, and I in a sense value that process more than what exactly the outcome was mm -hmm. um, so I can't pinpoint and say one child got this out of it and mm -hmm. I, I I mean we, we can share stories of how a child who used to be like this is now like this mm -hmm. um, but I, I think we have to be careful when we make those sort of labels mm -hmm. because I think a more accurate way of framing it is the child who used to interact with this community as it was then in these ways is now interacting with this community which may not be exactly the same community it was back then mm -hmm. in different ways. So the way the child is behaving is a function of the environment around him that has made him feel safer and made him feel more comfortable. So, like, let's say a child who was uh, shy and awkward, let's say, with speaking with others, now he's more comfortable speaking with others. That doesn't mean this child has moved from a shy child to a comfortable child. Yeah, right, right. And that we shouldn't then expect that, hey, you're so talkative and assertive at school, why can't you talk here with, uh -huh. in a different environment? That, that would um, not be very reasonable. Mm -hmm. So I think... All the things we can say are in terms of how the community has evolved and along the way the individuals in it may also have evolved, but uh, I'm not sure sort of like, you know, pointing at you know, this success story or that success story in, in that individual way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so, uh, so one, let's acknowledge the, the noise of children in the background and the, <laughs> we're in a different setting. Uh, so we are at IDEC in Nepal. Um, and and so uh, you know we're in Kathmandu. We're at the the ashram, um, what is Sri Aurobindo uh, Yoga Mandir. Yes. Um, and so uh, I noticed that your your uh, the name of your community is Kinder Republic, um, and I know you have a great video that uh, that the kids that you, that your community made mm -hmm. uh, with the kids explaining what that means. Uh, give a brief thing, and then we'll, we'll link to it. So. Yeah, we've been trying to figure out a name for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And then in that whole brainstorming process of thinking about democracy, education, self-directed, all of these things, uh, at some point, I think it was my wife who came up uh, with the uh, idea that it could be Republic something or something mm -hmm. Republic. So is it like a Republican school or this Republic? So then we were, uh, we liked the, sort of angle of republic uh, because we live in a republic, many countries are republics mm -hmm. and the sense that we are all citizens of the republic would be something we could use but then children's republic didn't seem somehow good but then mm -hmm. uh, I don't know maybe we were looking for synonyms or translations or something but then somehow this kinder word came up mm -hmm. so we um, and there's some familiarity in Sri Lanka that uh, because we use the word kindergarten for 
uh, preschools and we have the Kinder Joy chocolates. Okay. Um, so when they hear Kinder, I think there's an association with children, so Kinder Republic. Um, but we also like the fact that when it's written, you could also read it as kind of republic, yeah. uh, which we thought was quite appropriate as well because you know, schools and the world at large could do with more kindness. So why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, so what's the age range, and then tell us about kind of where it's located. Uh, right. Um, so we are in Pandipitia, sort of a suburb of Colombo. Um, earlier, the school was at a place that was about four and a half kilometers from where we live, but then we were running out of space there, so we needed a bigger place. And this time we found a place closer to home, which means we can cycle there quite comfortably. And um, uh, so that access is um, easier for us, at least. Uh, but for most of the community also, it was closer to come to the new place than the old place, except I think one family. Um, Age-wise, right now, it's 6 to 11, so the youngest is 6, oldest is 11. Um, when it comes to enrollments, we suggest that 5 to 12 ages might be better in that they're more likely to find things in common with the existing group, and of course, as the cohort evolves and ages, that uh, priority will change. But even if it's an older child or a younger child, the intent would be the same as for somebody of that age group that you need to come and experience it and see if it works for you. So you might be a 17 year old who's happy with this environment, you might be a three and a half years who's happy with it, and you might be a nine year old smack bang in the middle of the range who's not happy with it. So, right. Right. so, so um, one of the things, because of this is the agentic school podcast, um, one of the things I like to focus on is uh, you, you already described some of the decision making and how that process works. And it sounds like you actually are incorporating, uh, you, you're doing some of this through apps and, and devices. Mm -hmm. um, uh, tell me about, like, we'll shift to uh, conflict resolution because that's a big important piece as well. Tell me about your approach to conflict resolution. So, from the day we started, we had a clear intention that we would use restorative practices. Mm -hmm. This is because as parents, from shortly before the time the child was actually born, we had made a commitment to not use any kind of punishments nor any kind of reward mm -hmm. because a reward is just a punishment backwards. So mm -hmm. saying, I'll give you this chocolate if you do this is the same as saying, if you don't do this, I will not give you the chocolate. Um, so um, it was a little bit difficult because we had been so conditioned to deal with things in a sort of retributive way. You know, somebody has done something wrong, there should be a punishment for that. And to overcome that trauma in a way was a struggle. And sometimes you stumble and you have this instinctive reaction to do something to punish, like take something away or, or something. And then you realize that you messed up and then you try to make things up. But the good thing was that by the time it came to start in the school, we had been on that journey uh, for a fair while, so we were more comfortable now extending this also to children who are not our children. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so it's been part of the way we do things from the day we started. And uh, the principle is that if you have been hurt in some way, you're sad, you're angry, you're frustrated, any sort of negative emotion, um, and usually it means that somebody has done something that made you feel that way, but it isn't always that. I mean, you might be sad because you remembered your grandmother who passed away, which was external. But anytime somebody feels some hurt, you can reach out either just informally on a one-to-one -one basis, mm -hmm. or if you need the additional support, then in a slightly more formal council sort of setting. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea is the person who was hurt says their story. This happened, this made me feel like this, whatever it is. Um, and then if that action involves somebody doing something, we would clarify, okay, you know, this is their story of what happened, what is your story? Mm -hmm. And sometimes some you know, additional nuances come up because the initial complaint was, you know, this person pushed me. Uh, but then the backstory might be that, well, I know I had been asking for a turn with this for like so many times and this person wasn't doing it and then I got frustrated and I pushed the person. So um, uh, 
then if, if something like that emerges, it then goes back to the other person to also think, okay, now you have heard how this person felt when they asked several times and you hadn't responded to them. How do you feel now after hearing that? So we mm -hmm. go through understanding our feelings, others listening to the feelings. And then the question is, now that we understand what has happened and the emotions or feelings around it, what do we think should happen mm -hmm. in order to make things right? Um, and sometimes the fact that we've heard each other is enough and there's nothing else needed. Sometimes there is an apology or a hug or something like that. Uh, or sometimes there is some kind of reparation mechanism. Okay, uh, you broke this, we should replace it or something like that. But um, <clears throat> uh, unless there was some, I don't know, very deliberate intent on the person to break or damage something usually doesn't go to that preparation level mm -hmm. um, because I think the key part of it is that in the normal justice system you label somebody as the perpetrator as the wrongdoer and you, you distance them from the community you make them a part of it right. and in the restorative process uh, we don't do that labeling we just acknowledge that harm has happened different people may have contributed in different ways to this uh, either in terms of doing something or in terms of not doing something mm -hmm. and then we just collectively try to address the harm so this supposed perpetrator is also part of the community and feels heard respected empathized with so they want to be with the community again because this community is not trying to hurt them they want to right. come in and uh, that eventually helps them to understand that an apology isn't just about saying the words because mm -hmm. this happened with a new child where he was saying he was sorry but we could sort of sense that he's saying it more of habit than uh, with any remorse and it was also evident because he used to do the same thing again whereas if you were genuinely repentant you would make an effort to improve and this came coming up that you know you mm -hmm. keep saying this but we can't trust you and uh, if you want us to trust you then you have to keep your promise and then there's of course other places in the system about keeping your promises as well that then affects how your credibility so um, sometimes there is that kind of pushback but I think always the message, uh, underlying principle is that we are trying to help you mm -hmm. uh, so that we can all be happy together, all live well together. We are not trying to hurt you. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's a implicit understanding that is necessary for restorative practices there to understand that everybody in every moment is acting the best way they know how in that moment mm -hmm. and sometimes that best way may be hurtful for other people but it's coming that either this person has role modeled mm -hmm. uh, an adult or another child who was uh, doing these things and this person thought this is the way to do this or they it may have somehow been a trauma uh, response that they have learned like mm -hmm. uh, if there's a lot of violence in your home, maybe one way of dealing with it is that you just shut down and you don't hear anything. And then that's the trauma response that you learn. Um, and then somebody who has that kind of response and subject to a stressful situation, the way they respond is still the best way they know how. And if right. we won't, would like for them to behave in some other way that was you know, less destructful, less hurtful, then we need to recognize that this person has been hurt. We need to help this person to heal and then they can uh, not do those things that we would like not to see happening. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that, that a lot of um, schools, particularly democratic schools, um, provide is opportunities to do things that other schools don't give opportunities for. Um, now, field trips are often a thing, but there, you can usually do more of them. Uh, but in particular, there, there's often opportunities to do things that might be considered dangerous or, or not appropriate for children in some way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I assume that's true for you as well. Um, and so the, the, the question is really, how do you ensure that they're safe and that they're responsible for, for in those situations? Okay, so physical safety is something we are um, concerned about. So um, 
if we are cooking something and we're eating something hot, then as of now, sort of the standing order is that it's one of the adults who will do this. When you are ready to demonstrate to us that you can do this safely, then you may do this. Uh, sometimes with frying things or boiling things in, in certain limited spaces where we feel confident enough that we are not taking a risk with the uh, child's health, then we would do it. So it's uh, uh, how I see that evolving is as they get more confident, they will want to experiment more and then um, they will, we will figure out ways how they can get a license to do things right, right. because I mean we we've, we've had that whole licensing thing going on at home with our son so oh, at a okay. fairly young age he was using knives to cut tomatoes and things like that so initially I was standing right behind him with my like heart in my mouth and like is he gonna cut himself is he gonna cut himself but then after a few iterations of that I was more comfortable just being in the room and now it's at the level where I don't even need to be there mm -hmm. There are knives he could access that he isn't, uh, in my view, able to use safely, but mm -hmm. we have an understanding on that, that if he wants to use it, he would ask, and then we would be around to support him. Right. Uh, as long as he's interested that we would support him, so we we don't have to be very specific about it anymore, that mm -hmm. understanding exists. But at school, yes, so far, the knives are used only under supervision. Um, there have been, on, at the earlier place, there was a child who was climbing the boundary wall. Mm -hmm. And then some other children came and informed us and said, so-and-so is on the wall and we don't think it's safe. Mm. So the immediate thing is, okay, please come down and let's go and talk about this. So mm -hmm. then what is the concern? We are worried that he might fall and uh, fall off and hurt himself. So um, now safety is one place where we can sort of impose our authority because mm -hmm. we believe that that's part of the expectation of the parents that you know right. we, we would <laughs> exercise judgment in deciding whether somebody could hurt themselves so, so I said you know because in this case I have the authority um, my understanding is that this was probably unsafe for most of you but given this particular child's history, it might be safe for him. Mm. But what I suggest is if he wants to do it, he does it while I can observe him. And if I believe that he is in control of himself up there, then he can have the license to do this. And then that opportunity also obviously extends to anybody else. Um, so at that time, I think he didn't want to pursue that licensing regime. He decided to do some other things, but that mm. would be the way we would approach something and what we've noticed also is that the uh, some children will come and report it not in a sense of telling tales mm. but more from a collective ownership that we want all of us to be safe right so if one of us sees something that is not safe then uh, we will raise it and then that isn't only about the physical safety it also extends to the emotional safety mm -hmm. uh, and why if you are you know, sad or hurt or angry or upset or anything like that. Um, and sometimes the degree of self-awareness is surprising. That sometimes a child might say like, okay, I'm, I'm feeling upset with this and I need some alone time and I'm going to be here. And they go there and they just, that means they want to be alone and the others let them be. They respect mm -hmm. that. And they've learned um, at well, 40 years faster than I learned it may be, uh, that this is a way to work through your emotions in a way that doesn't hurt others because rather than exploding at somebody, if you realize you're getting to that tipping point, it's maybe better to go somewhere and cool down and you realize you're doing this consciously. And, mm -hmm. um, so that sort of self-awareness is good. Uh, good. Nice to see. And then... You know, sometimes someone who's close to that person might go in in a while and check and do you right. still need a lot of time or can I give you a hug and and this extends to adults as well so if um, um, if you get frustrated about something mm -hmm. and they notice this then they might come and ask so uh, how are you feeling and can I give you a hug right mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. uh, I was talking with Isabel uh, after a session today and I think that the 
hug is the second form of communication we learn. The first one is mm-hmm. crying because you yeah, know, you're, you're, you're born crying. Um, but and then for a while crying is the only form of communication, you know. But then we pretty early on um, learn how that affection is transmitted through a hug, and mm-hmm. um, and I think that's a very powerful way of connecting with people mm-hmm. with uh, helping them through a tough time and mm-hmm. um, so they use it consciously you know in that yeah. way very cool um, so one of the things that because we're we're in very different contexts and, and our audience is potentially global um, tell me a little bit about kind of the larger context in Sri Lanka um, some some countries, you know, closely regulate. Even a democratic school has some requirements that they may need to meet. Um, what's the situation? And, and 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 the role of local authorities can very very be very different. So what what's your situation as a school um, in in relation to sort of requirements or whatever the government does? Um, so I think one of the things a bit typical in the global south maybe mm-hmm. is that laws are not always enforced mm. so um, especially when it comes to say laws around private schooling for mm, a little bit more than 60 years the law has not allowed any private schools to be established mm. uh, but nevertheless because there has been a demand people have started schools mm. and the net result really of it is that they are not registered in any single place. The Ministry of Education doesn't know exactly how many of them there are or how mm-hmm. many children there are. They don't have the authority to go to such a school and say, can I see if your teachers are certified or qualified? Right, right. Uh, because as far as the Ministry is concerned, they're not at school. Right. Um, <laughs> um, so it's a bit unfortunate um, because it also means, I mean, Sri Lanka is not very big on zoning laws or things like that, but mm-hmm. even the inspection of, okay, is this building safe to have this many people? If there was a fire, can this, can all, is there adequate ways for these people to escape? So mm-hmm. you can't, uh, I mean, even if you had the zoning law, you can't enforce it because this is still not a school. <laughs> this is, I don't know what it is. Right. Um, so we are also in that sense operating on the edge. Um, mm-hmm. But UNESCO says that the South Asian region is the region with the highest amount of private education in school going age. Mm. Uh, so according to their estimate in Sri Lanka, about 10% of students are in non-government schools. Mm. And then the percentage is way higher in India. Mm. Um, and this is, I think, because education has been underfunded by the government. So people who have money have better opportunities by not remaining stuck with the government system mm-hmm. um, so there are more and more children in unregulated uh, private schools so we are also in that sense an unregulated school uh-huh. um, so there are I mean in one sense it means it's easier to get things started mm-hmm. because you don't have to deal with the red tape or anything like that but the downside is that it appears risky for some parents because, right. you know, okay, first of all, they're talking some very weird thing of democratic <laughs> education and all this stuff. And then on top of that, they're not actually recognized as a school. Like, so it, it's it's an additional hurdle for parents to overcome when they are considering this as an option for their family. Mm-hmm. So, so speaking of parents who may not be familiar with it and, and see it as something unusual, um, how do you address that with parents? Like, is there a particular way that you talk about democratic education or specifically your school? I think we're still figuring out how to communicate this well. Mm-hmm. Um, so far, really all, well, our son never went to school because we knew that we would build an alternative, mm-hmm. but everybody else has been to school for either a few months to a few years and then the parents acknowledge that this wasn't working for the children and they pulled the children out then and after some time they found us and mm-hmm. they were happy with the kind of experience we were providing. We are not yet somehow at the level where somebody would 
see what we are doing align with it well enough to pull their child out of school in order to in come. Order, yeah. 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 So it's um, because there's a lot of challenges with doing that. Um, one is that it may have taken a lot of effort and money to get the child in the school in the first mm -hmm. place. So that sunk cost is a sunk cost. Whatever happens, it's <laughs> gone, but you have an emotional attachment to that sunk cost. So you don't want to like leave behind the money that you paid as the right. admission fee. Uh, and on top of that, when you struggle to be sure if this is something that's going to work, it's, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. But um, the sort of approach we take is we invite them to look through our social media and our website. Mm -hmm. uh, we can have like a Zoom call or things for you to clarify things. And then when you come and visit and spend the day at the school so that the mm -hmm. child can experience what it's like and how they feel like and then uh, for the children who be pulled out at school, usually that one day has been sufficient to decide if they want to join mm -hmm. us because they're already just at home anyway. Right. Um, and for families who are thinking about um, making the switch, we would say, okay, you can come for an extended trial during the school mm -hmm. holidays with the understanding that if the child is happy with this, then, then you will switch. Um, so that's... Um, I mean, Sort of the proof of the pudding is in the eating, so come eat the pudding and see <laughs> yeah, yeah. if it works for you. So, so you, you, your test period is typically one day. We say we start with a day, ah, and then and then let's see because for some children that has been enough, and if you need more than that, then let's figure out how to do more than mm -hmm. that. Yeah, yeah, I've heard a variety of methods for it. Like, I think the village free school was like a mandatory whole week, like mm -hmm. like. Um, but I think it varies with your context and what you're, you know, what you're doing. Um, cool. Um, so, so one of the things that I, I think is really interesting is that schools like this tend to develop unique things that they do, mm -hmm. and uh, one of them is is sort of uh, like uh, particular things that like uh, gestures or, or or ways, code words, mm -hmm. things like that, jargon. Um, and are, do you have you developed any that you think would be great if, if the kind of the wild, wider world adopted it? Um, well, I think one thing is a bit more intentional than evolved, but the idea of calling everybody citizens and mm -hmm. that uh, from the name itself conveys the equality of rights. Mm -hmm. um, jargon wise, something we have is that. At some point, we wanted to appoint somebody who would fetch the paper that they for to do art or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And then, so what do we call this person? And then they were saying like, okay, since we are Kinder Republic, we should call that person the Paper Blick, <laughs> right? Uh, okay, so uh, and then we don't have Paper Blicks anymore, but we do appoint daily cleaning Blicks, mm -hmm. and then. Um, um, uh, okay, there's a, we also have flag blicks, mm -hmm. and I'll tell the story why we have a flag blick. So, uh, in Sri Lankan schools and in any public institution, the standard ritual is that you have the national anthem to commence proceedings. Mm -hmm. We didn't have that. Um, but then, a few months back, there was this big hoo ha because um, a famous singer, when singing at a big event, mispronounced one word, which called Sri Lanka instead of mother, he called it Mr. sort of thing. One pronounced. So there was this big drama and like questioned by the police and ministers getting involved. And so we told them uh, the story to children. They were like, okay, one mistake of what? Why is this so much fuss about this, right? Uh -huh. But then we asked, okay, um, there is all that, but would you like to learn the national anthem? And then uh, they said, yes. And then we proposed, would you like to start the day with this? And they agreed to that. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have it as a practice where the agreement is, you can decide whether to join or not join. Mm -hmm. If you join, there are certain expected behaviors, so you, you know, stand to attention, either you are silent or you sing. Mm -hmm. You can't be like, you know, jumping about or waving about mm -hmm. and the things that you have the freedom to do other times doesn't work here because we have some agreements in this country about how we respect anthem. Mm -hmm. So if you're not happy with that, it's perfectly fine. You can do something else on your own. Uh, without disturbing this ritual. But 
So far, nobody has made use of that opportunity. They all want to come, mm -hmm. and they also want to hold the flag. Uh -huh. And then, uh, so initially there was one child who was always fetching the flag, and then others asked for a turn, and he wasn't giving it. And then they said, that, like, I'm not getting a turn. This is not fair. And then we looked at our values where we talk about taking turns. So should we take turns for the flag? Yes. Then we counted how many times each person has had. And it turned out there have been people who wanted it, who had never said it because, you know, when these other people are arguing about it, they didn't, they weren't, it wasn't safe enough for them to say that I also would like to hold mm -hmm. it. So now we sort of have a roster and we keep track of who has had how many turns. <laughs> um, and they are very proud to be the flag lick for the day. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Yeah, that that is actually a nice chart into your unique planes because it's it's not transferable. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Um, well, I mean, you to transfer in other ways, so that very would have berries. Uh, oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> <A> Flagberry. <laughs> nice. <laughs> oh, how many students do you currently have? Right now, twelve. Uh, twelve will come regularly. Some come five days a week. Some less than that. So mm -hmm. it, it depends on what works for them. Um, at the earlier place, we were at 10. When we hit 10, we realized we were out of space, so we had to move. So we mm -hmm. couldn't uh, work on enrollments until we sorted out the move. But we are in conversation with some people. So hopefully, over the next few months, we'll have a few more coming in. Yeah. So you actually, so you call it licensing when you're kind of giving uh, someone an opportunity to do something that may be dangerous. Or mm -hmm. um, uh, are screens part of that? Like phones, devices, things like that? There was one time our son proposed that we could use the iPad at meal time or something like that, and it got watered down. Mm -hmm. Then there was a time that there was one activity in the schedule called mobile games where they could bring a mobile device and play the mobile game. That hasn't been coming up that much. I think maybe at this point, they feel it's more useful to use the time to do things with other people then take turns on a mobile device. It, mm. I mean, it may also be because there isn't isn't enough mobile devices for everybody to play at the same time. Because if there was, then maybe they would do some cooperative or competitive online game together. Mm -hmm. um, so it hasn't become an issue yet. Mm. Uh, if somebody felt that somebody was spending too much time on their device, then I think they would raise it in the parliament, raise their reasons mm -hmm. for concerns, and then uh, some decision would be made. Right. Um, and hopefully it would be a decision that everybody is, is happy with. Mm -hmm. um, but so far we haven't had that thing coming. And as adults, I don't think we would have any particular need to control or limit the screen time mm -hmm. as such. Well, um, I mean, if we did have a concern, then we would also raise it in the right. parliament <laughs> and, and then we are also just a citizen in that sense. Right, right, right. Now with your, do you have, like you have a small group, so you probably handle things pretty quickly in terms of anything that comes up, either decisions or, or you know, conflicts. Um, so do you have like a, a formal end, like, well, I guess you, you said you can either handle it informally or just bring it to, mm -hmm. I mean, now do you have meetings like every day, every week? What's, how's the meeting? So we have, uh, a budget meeting once a week hmm. with the intention that things you want purchased for next week, you bring it up there, you get mm -hmm. it approved and then it can be purchased. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Apart from that, we have a slot for Restorative Council stroke parliament every evening. Mm -hmm. We used to have actually half an hour for that and half an hour snack. Now they wanted to eat while doing this and said they can focus. So we are now experimenting with a one single 45 minute slot for both of them. Mm -hmm. um, but if there is nothing tabled for the parliament or for the Restorative Council, then the open time before that just extends and then there's the meeting doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So if the meeting is happening, we say we, are, we have this uh, to take up today and we take it up, otherwise it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So the time slot is there and if, it, if there's no need for it, it just becomes an uh, open time. Wow. Wow. So I, I think we'll, we'll start to wrap up. Um, and one of the questions I'd like to, have to address is, uh, 
tell about a time when there was a challenge in your community, um, but ever you know either someone or or the community is better for having met the challenge. Mm -hmm. I think of which story. Um, okay, um, which one? Um, they have invented this game where they have this chair, roller chairs, that they push around and they call them buses. So they have bus routes and there's tickets and there's bus stands and there's licenses and insurance, traffic lights, police. So this has evolved over a period, mm -hmm. and uh, then all the roller chairs had owners and then one other child joined and he doesn't have a bus so there was a cushion and he started rolling this cushion and then everybody called this cushion the one wheel then and he rolls it very fast so then suddenly there was this concern that uh, so and so is rolling this cushion fast and it's bumping us and we're falling down and this is not safe and i want to take it up so the concern was raised and there had been a similar concern raised about the buses and bumping into people and the agreement was then was that they should drive the buses carefully enough so that they don't knock over people. Mm -hmm. So thought same thing is probably going to happen here. And then as we open the discussion, suddenly somebody proposes uh, that I think we should not use one wheel for this purpose at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Uh, there's a proposal like this. Can we see what you all think about it? And it turns out that eight people were in favor of that, four people were not. Mm -hmm. But this is not a vote. This is just, like I said before, uh, testing the water. So, okay, people who are in favor of this proposal, why? Mm -hmm. So then one concern was the original one raised that he comes and bumps us. Second concern was that sometimes he tries to stand the cushion on its side and then stand on it and this is not safe and he might hurt himself. So now harm to others, harm to himself. And then also that in the process of using one wheel as a vehicle all this while, it has now got deformed and it's not the shape it used to be. So now there's damage to property also. Okay, so three reasons why we should not allow this. So then we ask the children who are against this, why are you against this? Um, and this was sort of the thinking that blew my mind because I as an adult will never have thought of this. Mm -hmm. um, and this child says, okay, all of the reasons are good, but this is this person's only vehicle. Mm -hmm. If we ban this from being a vehicle, he will not have a vehicle. So that's sort of one level of empathizing. And mm -hmm. then the second level of sort of understanding social dynamics is, and then he will come and steal our buses. Mm -hmm. And then while we were sort of wowed at this sort of level of interpretation of thing then another child said okay if that is the concern i will donate my bus to this person mm. and then we asked okay so your concern has been the concern you said gave for no has been addressed so are you all okay with it and then yes so it, it was agreed that that one wheel can no longer be used as a one wheel but apparently i still have to call it one wheel i can't call it cushion anymore it's, the name stands <laughs> even if the purpose doesn't yeah. And he got upgraded to a bus. So the way they went through that, I think, showed uh, far more empathy than how we might have approached that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if somebody had come and complained to me that so and so is rolling this and it's bumping us, then the sort of adult way of looking at it would be to okay, give him one morning to be careful, or mm -hmm. next time, okay, you are forbidden from using this. That's mm -hmm. how we would have imposed our authority on the situation and mm -hmm. here they demonstrated uh, um, much better skills of handling conflict i thought mm -hmm. very nice now um so wrapping up so uh tell our audience uh, where can they reach you or find out more about kinder Ruhola? so our website is kinder.lk k-i-n-d-e-r.lk uh, you can search for us as Kinder Republic on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter. So the and on YouTube as well. So the uh, on Facebook and in Instagram, it's actually like facebook.com slash Kinder Republic dot school because mm -hmm. Kinder Republic was taken for somebody else. Mm -hmm. But I think on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter or X, so we have the Kinder <laughs> Republic handle. All right, great. Well, thank you very much. 
appreciate your time. Thank you. That was great talking to you.